37 verses 1 through 4, we stand in honor of the reading of God's word. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Hallelujah. A lot of people make the mistake of believing that the shepherd boy David who went on to kill the giant Goliath and then who later went on to become king of Israel after the first king Saul died. A lot of people make the mistake of believing that the Psalms were all written by David. They were not. The truth of the matter is he wrote many, he may have even written most, but many of them were written by other authors. The Jewish people collected them and they used them as a sort of a, almost a prayer book or, or a song book. And many of the psalms were written specifically to be sung. When you read a psalm, for instance, and you see the word at the end, selah, S-E-L-A-H, that implies, a, that is a musical term, and that implies that that song was written to be sung. It was not merely written to be read. It was not merely written to be uh, read aloud, you know, to the congregation. It was actually written to be sung. And if you go to many Jewish synagogues, they do sing those songs. That's why the Word of God tells us to sing unto the Lord with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In the instance of Psalm 137, it is likely that David did not write this particular psalm. Now, if you look at Psalm 138 in most Bibles, it will say at the very top, a psalm of David. So if, if David authored the psalm, does it say that in your Bible? See, all right, and that's Psalm 138 at the top. It'll say a psalm of David. But you'll notice in Psalm 137, it doesn't say that, does it? Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, the psalm that we read in the, the book of, of Psalms 137, this particular lamentation, as it were, was written apparently by a Jew during the time of the Babylonian captivity. It was during the time when the Jewish people did not occupy their homeland, Israel. They did not occupy Zion. Instead, they were being held captive in Babylon. And the word of the Lord tells us, by the rivers of Babylon, we hung our hearts up in the trees. What the writer is saying is, we lost our song. We felt no motivation to sing the songs of Zion. We felt no motivation to worship the Lord like we would worship Him in Jerusalem, like we would worship Him in Israel. No! Circumstances have changed. Circumstances are dark and negative and bad. And under these circumstances, I've just lost my song. And if I don't feel the desire to sing, I might as well just hang my harp up in this tree by the rivers of Babylon. There we hung our harps up in the willow trees. Then the people of Babylon came along. Their captors came along and said to them, Hey, why don't you sing some of those songs that you're famous for? Because there's something about... Music that is designed to worship the Lord God, Jehovah, that's designed to worship the Lord, Elohim. There is something about that that is so uplifting and so inspiring. 
I've had Jewish people tell me, literally, I've had Jewish people tell me that they love gospel music. Jewish people. They don't even believe in Jesus. And they love gospel music. Why? They, one guy told me one time, he said, I don't care how depressed I get. I don't care how bad I feel. I don't care what my situation or circumstance. He said, I'll turn on some of that Christian gospel music. He said, and my God, do I start to feel better. Do I ever start to feel good? He said, I just feel better and better by the minute listening to, here's a Jewish fellow. How many people in our world, we don't know, how many people in our world are Muslim and Hindu and uh, whatever Sikh, and they will sneak a listen to gospel music once in a while because it lifts them up, it lifts their spirits. And Martin, this, in this story today, as we read the Psalm 137, the Babylonian captors came and said to the children of Israel, Why don't you sing those wonderful songs? Those uplifting, inspiring songs that we have heard about. Oh, I mean, it is famous around the world. People talk about when they used to go to Jerusalem, when they used to visit the temple, when they used to visit the synagogues in Jerusalem and in Israel. Oh, how beautiful the music was. Why don't you sing those songs for us? The Jewish people's answer was, how can we sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? said, how can we sing the Lord's songs under these circumstances? How in the world, Martin, you ever feel like that? Oh, my God, you ever lost your song? <laughs> oh, I mean, things aren't going too well. Things are looking pretty bleak. Things are looking pretty dark. And all of a sudden you find that, well, uh, yesterday I could sing, but things have changed. I'm no longer on ground that I'm comfortable with. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not where I normally am. I'm not where I feel the best. It's, I'm not in that place where I feel like God is wonderful and everything's going good. Isn't it funny how many people can only worship God Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to get Pentecost on you today, I'm telling you. Because I had an experience yesterday put me to the test. I'm going to share it with you. It's going to come. Wait till you hear it. How many of us can only worship God when things go well? How many of us can only worship God when we're in a certain place? When we're in a certain frame of mind? when circumstances are just a certain way. How many of us have experienced the loss of our song? I'm going to tell you, it's happened a couple of times to me. I've had, I've had those occasions where I hung the harp up in the willow tree. Hello now. I said, all right, things right now. Oh, I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, back in November 2016, you know where I'm going. How many of us immediately woke up the morning after the election and looked at the television and saw the results and immediately picked our harp up and put it up in the willow tree? Because things changed. Uh-oh, now we're in Babylon. Hello now. Now we're held captive in Babylon. We're not on Zion's ground anymore. We're not on that holy, hallowed ground anymore. It, think, it seems like things, it doesn't seem like it is that things in our country now, a year and a half later, have so drastically changed. We're not on the same ground we were on before. No, things have changed. We, we've got racism running rampant. We've got hatefulness. And it starts at the top. Yeah. we got somebody at the top of the heap who is sowing more seeds of division and more seeds of negativity and more seeds. Oh, my God. And it is creating this toxic environment. And, you know, Tommy and I have talked about it. People on both sides of the political aisle are feeling it whether they even realize it or not. That's right. 
There's not a person in this country, Martin, that is not feeling this negative, heavy cloud. Now, some of those people welcome it because all that negativity and all that suspicion and all that garbage, they welcome. But they're feeling it. But then you got people on the other side of the aisle, my God, we're looking at this and we're putting our hands on our face and saying, Dear Jesus, what is happening? We are losing our democracy. We are losing our republic. This thing's falling apart right in front of us. Can't believe what I'm seeing. Everything's changed. How can I sing the Lord's song? How can I sing the Lord's song now? Now, things are not conducive. I, I better just hang it up in the tree and I'll wait until things get back to where they should be. Mmm. How many of us feel that way today? Amen. My yeah. Lord, too many of us. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, too many people lose their song when they fail at school. When the furnace breaks at the house and you find out it's going to cost you four grand to fix it. When your wife, your husband, your partner asks for a divorce. When you fall sick and you don't feel well, all of a sudden you hang that harp up. Martin, when you're overloaded at work and you don't seem to ever be able to get caught up on your rest and you, you just can't seem to find your energy, all of a sudden the old harp goes up in the tree. Doctor diagnoses cancer. The harp goes up in the tree. Things have changed. I'm not on the same ground I was on yesterday. I'm not in the same place I was yesterday. Broken relationships. Sometimes all it takes is a speeding ticket. <laughs> Amen. You ever get a speeding ticket and you're holding it in your hands saying, doggone it, i got to pay $150. And boy, your song goes out the window real fast. So all of a sudden, you don't feel like praising God. All of a sudden, you don't feel like worshiping the Lord. You take that old harp and you hang it in the tree. Say, all right, Lord, I'm not in the same place I was. Oh, now I'm captive to this stupid speeding ticket and i got to pay this $150 speeding ticket. You go to get yourself some milk for your cereal and find out your old refrigerator finally give out. Doggone it, i got to go pay $500 for a new refrigerator. You have to call the lawyer, file for bankruptcy. Finances have fallen apart. You've got more bills than you have money. You don't know what to do. Financial troubles have come. Your heart goes in the tree. You have a car accident. Your heart goes in the tree. Somebody serves you papers that you're being sued. Oh, brother, that heart goes in the tree. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. I'm trying to share a number of things because I, I want to make sure everybody identifies with what I'm talking about. Amen. Some of us, sadly, have experienced about every one of these. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but some of the younger people online, hopefully they've only experienced one or two. But I want to make sure everybody understands what I'm talking about. Circumstances and situations can cause us to feel like we're not in the same place. Oh, yesterday I was in Happy Land. Today I'm in Depressionville. Hello now. Yesterday I was in Joyville, and today I'm in Sadville. Things are different. Circumstances have changed. How in the world can I worship God? How in the world can I sing the songs of Zion? in a strange land. How can I worship God in this space with this circumstance and this situation going on? You follow what I'm saying? All right, now buckle your seatbelts. You're going to hear my story and it's going to take a while. <laughs> Where to begin? I've been dealing with brokers and uh, real estate people now for a long time, a couple of years, mind you looking for some property that I've been wanting, as you know, to set up a little campground that our church can use as a recreational facility. I believe, now I'm a country boy at heart, okay? I didn't grow up in the country of Texas. I grew up, believe it or not, in the country of southern New England. 
Now you might think Southern New England doesn't have any country, but it really does. I didn't even realize it until I came down here and found out what country was, and all of a sudden I realized, hey, I come from the country. I, I grew up in a town with about 3,000 people. I grew up in a town where when you did business with somebody, here was your contract. I come from a town, uh, uh, Brother Johnny, where what come off these lips was as good as gold. You could take it to the bank. My grandmother told me one time when I moved out of my home state of Connecticut, I moved away from the little community I grew up in, and I began to live in other parts of the world, and, and all of a sudden people were doing me dirty, and people were not keeping their word, and weren't doing like they were supposed to, and their handshake was worthless, you know. And I complained to my grandmother, my grandmother said, Chuck, you, you don't understand, you grew up in Norman Rockwell's backyard. You know, you grew up in small town America. You grew up in an environment where people have to conduct themselves differently. Because if that contractor didn't keep his word, we're from a small community. Even if you go up the road of town or down the road of town, you know, the towns were bigger than my town. Any town was bigger than my town. There were towns that were bigger than my town that had more cows than people, okay? Mm -hmm. But, you know, she said... You don't understand in, in, in Connecticut, in this environment that you grew up in, said, you know, people, if they don't keep their word, they're going to go out of business. Because yeah. the minute you don't keep your word, Martin, nobody's going to shop with you. Nobody's going to. And let me tell you, word will get around so fast. Because right. everybody knows everybody. The town I grew up in, my, my school teachers had been my mother's school teachers. And some of them had been my mother's co-students. My third grade teacher, Donna Cole, she was a student with my mother in school. So, you know, my mother comes to have a student teacher conference and she's meeting with a girl she used to go to school with. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's how small a community of life. Everybody knows everybody. Well, I want to tell you, you do somebody dirty. You don't keep your word. You don't do things like you're going to be out of business so fast your head will spin. I remember, uh, I remember little things that we had a man in our community who had a construction company. He had heavy equipment, you know. And uh, if you needed earth moving done, if you needed uh, a ditch dug with a backhoe, you know, or if you needed bulldozers, and he owned that kind of equipment. And I remember hearing when I was just young that this man had a bad drinking problem. That he was known to have a problem with alcohol. Well, I'm going to tell you, my father wouldn't touch him with a 100-foot pole. My father wouldn't do business with him for nothing. We had another man, Dave Rupsis, who lived down the street from us, and he had a similar business. He also had heavy equipment. My father would do business with Dave Rupsis all the time. He wouldn't deal with this other man because... Everybody knew he was a drunk, you know what I'm saying? And, and he couldn't necessarily be depended on, and he wouldn't be there when he said. And I remember my father calling Dave Rupsis up. Now, I'm laying some groundwork. I'm going to get to yesterday. You say, brother, you're talking 40 years ago. Yeah, I am. I, I, I'll bring this up in a minute. My father would call Dave Rupsis and say, Dave, I need... We had a bad drainage problem on our property. A bad, we lived on a mountain. And the water come down the mountain in a certain spot, right down our property line, basically. And it just made a gully that was literally two feet deep. Literally. Because that water poured down, and it would come along the side of our house, and it would empty into our driveway. Guess what happened when temperatures dropped? We'd have a sheet of ice on the driveway because literally the rain would come, it would pour all over the driveway, right? We had a stone driveway. We didn't have a paved driveway. We had crushed up. I told you I lived in the country. Y'all got to stay up with this story now, okay? We didn't have, we had crushed stone, and that's what most people had. Very few people had a paved driveway. They had crushed stone, you know? Well, anyhow, we, that water, Johnny, would cut. I'm, I'm not kidding. We'd have ice that thick on the, on the drive when the temperatures would drop. You know, oh, my goodness. I remember one time we, my mother and I, we were trying to go to church, and we used to park on that. We parked on the ice, folks. I'm not kidding. We were 
so used to living like this. You know, Tommy looks at me like I'm insane. I try to tell him, you know, Michigan and up north that the temperatures and the climate don't bother me no way, no how. I, I can deal with it. I said, my God, I grew up in that stuff. Don't bother me no way. And one day, my mother's watching, probably on Facebook right now. Usually she's watching one way or the other. And uh, she said, CJ, Chuck Jr., help me, because she didn't want to fall on the ice. So I'm trying to help her, and boy, I mean, we're just going every which way. We look like we're, you know, a, a pair doing synchronized uh, ice skating for a little bit, and then we synchronized as we both fell flat to our butts. <laughs> And she looked at me and I looked at her and we just started laughing and said, oh, well, you, you helped me all right. <laughs> Both of us fell on our butts. Mm -hmm. All right, I said all that to say this. I've preached and I've told you in my preaching that there are certain attributes of your personality, certain attributes of who you are, that good or bad, you're never going to change them. I don't care how much you try. I don't care how much you, you make an effort to. There are things that become a part of you. Some things that are hereditary. Some things that you learn by observing. My father was about, he was about as gullible a sucker as anybody that ever was. I, I used to laugh at my dad when I was a kid. I'm not laughing anymore. I promise. I've quit. I have no right to laugh anymore because I've become him. My father used to read things in magazines, you know. You can buy 10,000 all cotton towels for just $39.99. Oh, hey, I can buy those. Then I can turn around and sell them to my friends and neighbors and family, and I can make money off that. So he ordered these 10,000 towels. And they came in a box about that big. <laughs> they were handy wipes. <laughs> Literally. And they had this computer thing. I, mother, I don't know if you remember this. They had this computer thing that you could hook up to your TV. And you're supposed to be able to use your TV kind of like a computer. This is way back. I mean, this is back in the late, maybe the early 80s or late 70s, somewhere around there. But it was some sort of a, you know, computerish thing. Well, he gets it. It's about what it's like. <laughs> and you hook it up all you want to. You ain't going to make it work. It's not going to do what they advertise. But he was constantly, constantly being taken in by these ads. And, the, you know, and part of it, I hate to say, I, I give my father a little bit of credit. He trusted that what you said is what you meant. Mm -hmm. And he was so trusting. Well, another little attribute he has that Junior has inherited. And y'all know this, so the minute I say it, y'all are going to know what I'm talking about. I get excited about things real fast and real easy. Don't take a whole lot to excite me. I mean, you know, the minute I see something that looks good and something I like, I mean, to tell you, boy, I get so geared up, all I can talk about is that. All I can do is just, you know, yak about that. I get so excited about things. My father was that way. Well, that is a learned behavior. I've got news for you folks. It ain't never going to change. I trust people. I expect what people say to be what they mean. If you show me a picture and tell me this is a picture of thus and so, I believe that's a picture of thus and so. Well, I've been dealing with realtors, trying to find us some land for out in the country, and I had a criteria, a list of criteria a mile long, had to do with climate, had to do with rainfall, because I want conditions to be ideal if possible, or as ideal as possible for, you know, this land to be used in a number of ways. Agriculturally, uh, possibly at some point raising some animals, you know. I, I do not, listen, I have no visions of creating a heaven on earth like David Koresh. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 
a recreational facility where, where our church people and we can have events, you know, maybe have a, a weekend camp out, you know, we can do things with young people, we can do things for married couples, kind of do a weekend retreat, you know, maybe even do a singles retreat or what have you, you know, all kinds, of, I've got all kinds of ideas and I've had these ideas for years. So I've been looking for land for years. Well, this one broker, this one real estate guy I've been dealing with, he'd come to me, hey, I'll tell you what, I've got the perfect property. It's so many acres, it's got a little pond on it, and he shows me the schematic of where it falls in the mountains of Oklahoma. Beautiful pictures. Almost paradise. I was going to go up there Thursday, but I was too tired after finally finishing my shed enough to put stuff in it. And I, I wanted to clean the garage so when Tommy come home Wednesday from his uh, being out of town for a trip, he could actually park in the garage again instead of it being my workshop, you know. That was my surprise. I wanted to do this. So I worked like a dog. Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, man, I worked like a dog. I was so tired Thursday. There was no way in the world I could go out to Oklahoma. Three-hour drive, three-and-a-half-hour drive. Couldn't do it. Friday, I decided, nah, I said, you know what, I'm going to wait till Saturday because I'd love Booby to go with me. I want Booby to be. After all, this is going to be quite the most wonderful experience there ever was. Little did I know it would turn into Bill and Ted's incredible adventure. <laughs> We're driving up there, and of course, I'm just a chatting. I swear to God, sometimes I want to put tape over my own mouth. I swear. <laughs> I'm driving, and I'm just talking, and I'm so I'm dreaming about what we can do, and I'm just so oh, my mind is racing, and oh, I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't know what. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to get there. Blah, blah, blah. And I get mad at Tommy because he's not sharing my enthusiasm. <laughs> I did. I said, boy, you don't know how to share anybody's enthusiasm, do you? Because I'm just a bubbling, you know, and he's like, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Drives me crazy, because I'm, I'm a naturally enthusiastic person, you know. <laughs> so I'm getting mad at him because he's not, not sharing my enthusiasm, you know. Boy, I've already put up a, I've already put up a, uh, a windmill for power, I've put up solar, I've built cabins, I've had this delivered, I've had that brought in, you know. Boy, I mean, my dream, we had a, whoo, boy, did we have us a campground up there. My Lord have mercy. Bill, I was already roasting marshmallows. I was already fishing out of the stock pond. I almost brought my kayak with me so I could test the depth of the water. I did, almost did. At the last minute, I told Tommy, I, I, at the last minute, I told him, that, I'm not going to bring any of this stuff up there today. I'm going to wait until next trip. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> that property met every condition I have. Every condition this property's got. Every condition. It's perfect. There's only one tiny, minute glitch. <laughs> You can't get there <laughs> unless you own a blimp or you have a helicopter or one of your hobbies is skydiving. You ain't getting there. Oh, the real estate guy told me, oh, well, you know, the developer went in and put in roads in the forest, you know, through the woods to all these properties and they have mountain roads. So. We recommend a four-wheel drive because, you know, some of the roads are a little steep and like that, you know. We recommend a four-wheel drive, but it's not necessary. It's just recommended. <laughs> My eyeball is recommended. <laughs> oh, brother, if you don't have a four-wheel drive, you are pot out of luck. Well, now, here comes Mr. Enthusiasm. We drive down, you know, the state highways. We get to the county road, it's gravel. That's all right, gravel road's all right. We get to the dirt road that leads into the woods. That's okay, I can handle dirt roads. According to the description they gave me, it was dirt roads. According to the picture they showed me, it was a dirt road. 
we drive down that dirt road about a mile, all of a sudden, all we're seeing are these washed out piles of rocks about as wide as a one lane road, literally, going down into the woods. And I mean, Martin, about every step you go, you hear in the bottom of your car, clang, clang, clang. <laughs> I said, oh dear Jesus, I just know I'm going to tear my muffler off. <laughs> so what do I do? What any sane person would do. I keep going. <laughs> yep. We get to a spot, <laughs> and I mean, all of a sudden, you feel like you're on a roller coaster, because now you got a dip goes down like this, and it's at about a 10 degree angle. <laughs> It's all rocks. There's a little bit of sand mixed in there, but it wasn't wet, it wasn't muddy. Tommy says, you don't want to go down there. I said, I said what do you know? Of course I got to go. The land is up there. How am I going to get to that land? If I don't keep going in my 2013 Dodge Minivan, of course it makes sense. I got front wheel drive. I've got the feature on my truck, on my van, where I can go like a manual transmission, you know. I can actually put it in manual, uh, first gear, second gear, so on and so forth. It has that feature. So I figured, I'm, I'm okay. It's front wheel drive. I'll put it in first gear. I'll just, you know, shimmy on it. And he said, you might get down, but my God, you'll never get back up. Yeah. What does he know? That land I want is out there. Now, I can't see that land from here. I've got to get out there. And I'm sure his murder not going to get out and walk. You know, the equivalent of 300 acres. I ain't walking over there. So I go down the first little thing. Well, you know, not so bad. We made it. A little scraping, a little, you know. We go a little bit further. I mean, just rock. Everywhere there's exposed rock. These fools, this so-called road they put in, no drainage. So guess what? The water just washes out the road. It follows the path of least resistance. This road, so-called, they created, it's not a road. It is... <laughs> It's a seasonal stream is what it is. It runs water when it rains, you know, and washes everything out. I mean, I'm talking rocks works, but big rocks, you know. Yeah. And here I am trying to avoid the rock. And then there's big old jagged rocks on the side. I'm trying not to hit the front of my... I'm going to tell you, thank God. Thank God God watches out for drunks and fools. <laughs> <laughs> it is a miracle I didn't total that thing. It is a literal miracle. <laughs> Because I'm going down, I'm trying to avoid this rock wall, I'm trying to avoid this one. I don't want to blow out my front headlight on this one while I'm trying to avoid this one. And I, but I want to see that land, by God, I want to see that land. And as we're driving, Tommy, who is my voice of reason, because when I get something in my head, all reason goes out. He's saying, are you sure this would be a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> even if we even if we follow through on this deal he said ain't nobody gonna be able to get back there he said John and Bill's truck ain't gonna get there Martin ain't gonna get there he said ain't none of us gonna get back there he said are you sure this I said listen I come to see that I drove three and a half hours to see that land I'm by God I'm gonna see that land so I kept right and there'd be little patches that were halfway decent. And then all of a sudden, you know, halfway level and all. And then all of a sudden, we hit another roller coaster. <laughs> so what do I do? Keep going. I keep going. The land's out there that I'm dying to see. Hey, if it's heaven on earth, maybe it'll be worth the rocks. And the, maybe I'll buy a four-wheel drive, and when everybody comes, I'll have them park out and boot dump somewhere. And then I'll drive them in the four-wheel. Seriously, you know, this is how my brain works. I'm, you know, I'm an optimist at heart, so I find a way around every trouble. You know, I've already got us buying army surplus vehicles with tracks on the back, you know. 
<laughs> you know, troop transports. I got with him two lots. Two lots of the land that I was looking for. And I'm telling you, there was a that so-called road, it was pure rock. Just <laughs> hundreds of rocks sticking out, jagged, jigging every which way, going up like this, then around like this. And I looked at the map I'm looking at, I said to Tommy, he's all we gotta do is go up here like this around. <laughs> and and then we gotta go up and then we go. He looks at me and says, uh, <laughs> Are you sure this is a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I was overcome with reason. <laughs> I'm still paying on that thing. I've already banged it every which way but upside down. So I said, you know what? I'm going to back up. I'm gonna, I, I, I. Now let me tell you, that road was narrow. It was just one car wide. And you were lucky if you had a little bit of grass on either side of your way. Well, I backed up a bit. I found a little spot. I did a 38-point turn. <laughs> turned myself around. Went back the other. Oh, I forgot to tell you, you have to drive through a street. <laughs> that was the fun part. I enjoyed that part. If you look at my van as you leave, you're going to see it look like I went four-wheeling. Okay? So I drive back. And of course we go down and we go up and we go around and we go this way and we go that. And we get to this one spot where the road just does this. And guess what? I can't get up the hill. Shut up. Who be said? You might get you might get it down, but you won't get back up. Well, guess what? For the first time in 17 years, he was right. <laughs> I tried, and I tried, and I tried. My tires were smoking. I was afraid I was going to set them on fire. I had my car in its little first gear, you know, the manual part. I had it in first gear because I figured, you know, low uh, ratio, to, uh, high torque ratio. You know, I can make it. I, if, I can just, if I can just catch that one rock. <laughs> that's sticking out. I'll be all right. I'll, I'll get where I'm going. And I tried. I'm not kidding. I must have tried 30 times, folks. My baby gets out of the van, out of the truck. The van. He's throwing rocks and he's throwing uh, wood and all kind of stuff in the holes. You know. I'm sure he was tempted a time or two to throw it at me. But if I got hurt, he'd still have to pay for the van. So that wasn't going to happen. He's trying to fill in, you know, the low spots where I keep spinning out and stuff, hoping we can grab, you know, get a little bit. It ain't happening. I don't know how long we tried to get out of that mess. Finally, I'm backing up. I'm trying to get a little bit of leverage, you know, get a little bit of room to, to, to get a run going, you know. Well, the soil was not wet. It was not mud. But the, the sand that was mixed in with the stone was just damp enough so that even when I would try to get a running start, all I, my wheels would spin the whole time. Well, you, you can't get any momentum going. You can't get, you know. So I'm going, and I'm trying to go up the hill, you know. It's not going to happen. So again, I back up. I said, well, let me see if I, if I go over this little spot over here, maybe I'll, I'll be able to catch some momentum with my drive tire, my right front tire. Maybe I can catch that little piece of ground over there that's got a little bit of grass and, you know, maybe that'll help me get enough momentum. Stupid truck went up on a little log and I was there to stay. <laughs> now I'm trying to get out of that spot and the van won't even move. I'm stuck as stuck can be. Oh, dear God, right? I said, Booby, um, uh, this might be a good time to call 911. <laughs> we might need the fire department or somebody to come rescue us. So Tommy calls, and they made arrangements to send out a tow truck, you know. And long story short, we sat there, I don't know how long, a long time, waiting. 
Uh, poor tow truck, bless his heart. He, did, you know, he had to come way out in the boondocks to try to find us. <laughs> While I'm sitting in the car, I've got a point to all this, folks. <laughs> While I'm sitting in the car, I said, "You know what? It's time to worship the Lord." Amen. <laughs> it's time to worship the Lord. I'm not in happy land. I'm not where I'd like to be. Circumstances are so opposite what I would like them to be. But I preach it and I mean it and I say it and I wish people would understand. I get so sick and tired of people telling me what the devil's done to them. If you're a child of God, the devil hadn't got power over you. If you're a child of God, the devil ain't doing nothing to you. He doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the authority. He doesn't have the ability. Old Job couldn't be tried without Lucifer standing before God and getting permission. Don't you tell me how the devil's tormenting you. I didn't sit there on that log in the middle of the boondocks at the bottom of a... 8,422 foot incline at 10 degrees. I didn't sit there believing the devil did it. I'm praying, you know, every time I go to try to go up that hill, I'm praying. Well, guess what? All the praying I did, that truck did not go up that hill. Martin, I didn't stop at the bottom of the hill and cuss God and say, well, God, you didn't answer my prayer. Bless God, I don't know what's wrong with you, Lord. I've been praying. I don't know why you didn't do this for me. Oh, and I know people who do. I said, all right, Lord, I get it. You're trying to tell me something. Gotcha. Message received. I gotcha. I got it. Okay. Apparently, this ain't no ahead for us. <laughs> Of course, I was still thinking about going and renting a four-wheeler and coming back and seeing if I could find it. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, all right, this ain't for us. It, it, it's not. Because the one criteria that I failed to have on my list was ease of accessibility. That's the one thing. Everything else it had, but it had no accessibility at all. So, anyway, we sat there for quite a while. I put my stereo on my little DVD player. You know that little old lady singing, There's a land of pure delight over there, over there. Where our faith shall end inside over there. There no sorrow and no sin will ever enter in. You know? Oh, she's singing for me. I'm feeling the Lord. I'm singing. I'm saying thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. You know why? Give me that harp. Hand me my harp. Hand me my harp. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what my circumstance. It doesn't matter what my situation. First of all, the devil didn't do nothing to me. God's in control of my life, not the devil. The devil didn't do... No, my God orders my steps. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Not the devil. Don't sit there, Christian, and blame the devil every time something don't go your way. If it don't go your way, it's because God is trying to tell you that's not the way he wants you to go. Amen. It's that easy. It's that easy. Of course, I wish I'd have figured that out a couple of culverts and a drop or two before I did, but you know. <laughs> but I won't take it. But I had a time listening to that music and singing along and just sitting there in that van. And I looked at Tommy and I said, you know something? When the tow truck finally got there and they were trying to get everything hooked, and boy, the, the man told us, he said, I'll be honest with you. He said, I've taken other people out of here. He said, yeah, the last guy we took out of here, listen to this, had a four-wheel drive truck. <laughs> and he burned down his transmission trying to come up this hill. That's what he told me, didn't he? He said, the last guy we had to pull out of here had a four-wheel drive truck, and he still burned out his transmission. He said, we had to literally tow him out, not only pull him out with the winch, the winch, uh, the winch, but they also had to tow him out because his transmission was gone, blown. Guess what? He pulled me out of there. We drove home. Don't tell me God ain't good. Mm -hmm. no. 
Don't tell me God ain't good. I was terrified at what it was going to cost me for this. See, I didn't call AAA because I figured AAA don't handle stupid. <laughs> I, I, said, I said, you know, AAA will get you on the road somewhere, but they ain't going to get you out in the middle of the wilderness, you know, out in the middle of the forest. When you're stuck in, in mud and, you know, I said, no, that ain't what AAA covers. So I called, we, you know, we called the fire department or whatever, 911. They contacted the tow. And they said to Tommy on the phone, said, now, you know he's going to have to charge you for this. Tommy said, yeah, we know. Well, we'll handle it. Thank God for credit cards. He charged us $200. Wow. Mm -hmm. I was shocked. Wow. I was shocked. I expected it, Martin, to be way more, way more yeah. than at least double that, at least, right? The man said two hundred dollars. I looked at him. He was a big bearded country boy. I mean, this guy looked like he'd just come off of a television show hunting <laughs> for Sasquatch. <laughs> I mean, overalls, beard, the whole thing. He looked the part right down the line, baby. Talk like it too. Very nice though. Very, very, and he had a little partner who was this cute little white boy. Chewing to back his teeth rotten out of his head. I mean, these fellas looked about as Oklahoma country as you're ever going to see in your life, you know. But they were sweet as pie. They were the nicest, nicest men. And they pulled us out and said, well, I'll lead you out in case you get stuck again somewhere. We'll be right in front of you, you know. And they led us out, and I drove that van home. Don't tell me God ain't good. Don't tell me God don't look out for drunks and stupid people, because i got news for you. He does. What a blessing. See, now, now, Johnny, I could look at that whole experience. I could find one lousy thing to get mad at. I got stuck, and I had to wait there for a few hours and all that. But if I look at it, I can see so many blessings in it that it's not even funny. Yeah, we got stuck, but I learned my lesson, and I realized, okay, Lord, maybe this ain't the path you want us to take. For one thing, we'll break our neck even if we try to walk. <laughs> Secondly, we got out of there with the, the nicest people helped us, and it cost me a fraction of what I thought it would cost. My vehicle, basically, I believe, um, until it blows up, is none the worse for wear. Just needs a car wash. I didn't, you know, bang up any rims. I didn't bang up the body. I didn't hurt anything that way. Hey. Why can't I play my harp? Why can't I worship God? You know, the problem with the children of Israel is they didn't realize that while they're in Babylon, God's still God. While they're in Babylon, God is still able to do things for them in that circumstance. They could have been blessed of the Lord in Babylon. Maybe God would make their workload lighter. Maybe God would give them favor with the authorities. Maybe God would uh, allow them to be more prosperous. And maybe the Lord would allow them a better life even during their captivity in Babylon. If only they'd have worshipped Him anyhow. Hallelujah! If only they'd have taken their hearts down from the willow trees and worshipped the Lord and sang the songs of Zion. The Word of God said, God literally dwells in the praise of his people Israel. We are today part of the spiritual house of Israel. God inhabits the praise of his people. When you worship the Lord, you invite his presence. So they weren't hurting God. They were hurting themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you look at Acts the 10th chapter, and I'm almost done today, I hope. I told you my anecdote concerning the property was a little long. Honestly, I'm embarrassed out of my mind by this whole thing. But if I don't look at life through humor, <laughs> I won't be crying all the time. <laughs> Acts chapter 10, verses 23 through 26, we read about Paul and Silas after they have been arrested for casting demons out of a woman and causing the men who managed this woman to lose their income source, a witch. Verse 23, then called he them in. Oh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Uh, hold on. Acts 10, make sure I'm at the right. 
wrote that in, right, Charles? I'm sorry, Acts 16, verses 23 through 26. I wrote 10, but it's 16. Y'all yeah, oh, forgive me, I had a hard day yesterday. <laughs> Acts 16, verses 23 through 26. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, meaning they whipped Paul and Silas, leaving them with deep gashes across their backs, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas complained. And at midnight, Paul and Silas griped. And at midnight, Paul and Silas blamed God. And at midnight, Paul and Silas blamed the devil. No. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, immediately, all the doors were opened. And everyone's bands were loosed. Uh -huh. You know why that Jewish boy likes to listen to gospel music? Because ooh, I got goosebumps all over me. I'll tell you why. Because even though when we Christians listen to it and we feel the presence of the Lord and we feel liberty, we feel like we're set free from whatever's troubling us and whatever's bothering us, I got news for you. So does he. So does he. Paul and Silas were in prison. They had been placed there for uh, in the deepest prison, literally in the deepest part of the prison, because this guard was charged with his life to guard them. And in ancient Rome, when a guard was told, if these men get loose, you're dead, they meant, if these men get loose, you're dead. So he wanted to make sure they didn't go anywhere. He not only put them in a prison, but he put their feet in stocks. They weren't going anywhere. You'd have thought in those circumstances, they'd have said, well, it's time to hang up my heart. Oh, woe is me. What a terrible life I've got. Oh, God, I don't know why, Lord, you let the devil put me in this prison. I don't understand, God, why. No, they understood the devil didn't have nothing to do with it. If they were there, they were there because God wanted them there. There was a job to be done there. Let me tell you, you may not understand why God's put you where you're at, but you're there for a reason. Trust me, it'll all come about. I don't understand why I drove three and a half hours yesterday so I could get stuck in the, in the woods and wait for hours in a hot, humid environment, afraid a bear was going to come lick my face. I, I, I'm telling you, I don't understand yet what that was all about, but I do believe with every ounce of my being, I trust my God enough to know that there was a reason and a purpose, and I'll be hanged if I'm going to question God. I'll be hanged if I'm going to second guess God. No, sir, my God knows what he's doing. His wisdom is perfect. His knowledge is pure. I have no business questioning. Hallelujah, his direction. Have no business questioning. And I'm not going to. I refuse to. Paul and Silas could have just fallen into deep despair. They could have sat there and, you know, misery loves company. <laughs> well, I mean to tell you if you ever... Oh, I got to tell you this, though. I almost forgot. I got to tell you this. I'm stuck here on this tree. The van is stuck. We're waiting on the... We're waiting on the tow truck to come. The tow truck comes, he starts pulling, you know, or he starts setting it up to pull out of it. And you know what Tommy says to me? I'm starting to get excited about getting some land in the country. <laughs> I said, this might not be the best time to tell me that. 
I've got my I've got my nine millimeter in the car. <laughs> and it wouldn't take a whole lot for the devil to motivate me to do something really. I looked at him and I'm thinking, you dirty dog. The whole trip up here, I'm so excited and I'm driving. Listen, I'm driving. I love the country. I love I love the country. I grew up in the country. I love mountains. I love trees. Every tree I see, literally to me, y'all might think I'm crazy. Every tree I see is a work of art. I look at the shape of it. I look at the, you know, the way of it. It, it, it. I could take a picture of every tree and appreciate the tree. Now, you may not appreciate nature the way I appreciate nature, but I love animals. I love trees. I love birds, you know. I love bodies of water, you know. And so we're driving up there, and I mean to tell you, I'm just in heaven. Holy mackerel. We're driving, and guess what? Unlike Texas, Oklahoma has trees, <laughs> mountains, birds. Guess what I don't see like I do driving for Uber and Lyft around here? Housing complexes, office buildings, homes that are all two feet apart so that if you comb your hair, the guy next to you looks better. <laughs> You know, I'm out there, it's just land, or beautiful land, beautiful, oh my God, it was beautiful. It really was. I, I, I'm telling you folks, I get crazy, y'all. So I'm driving up there and I'm just going, oh my God, I love this. This is so beautiful. Oh, this reminds me of home. This reminds me of up home. Oh, and it does a lot. It reminds me of up home a lot. I said, oh, I feel like I'm, I almost feel like I'm driving back home. Oh, what? Oh, this is wonderful. And there Tommy says. I said, don't you just feel better getting out of the city and, you know, being around this life? Doesn't this just make you, don't you just feel your blood pressure coming down? What does the twit say to me? Yeah, I said twit. What did he say to me? Well, my blood pressure wasn't up to begin with. I said, are you kidding me? Do you not understand what I'm saying? Can you not just simply say, oh, yeah, it's nice, you know? Can you not share my enthusiasm for all this? You just can't. I said, my God, I was so mad. <laughs> and then there we are watching a tow truck pull our van out of a wretched hole. And this donkey says to me, I'm starting to get excited now about some like... <laughs> Oh, I'm going to tell you, if y'all don't think marriage is fun, <laughs> it's fun all right. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, I passed the test. I passed the test. What test? I said, well, I've told you before that Every time you preach a message as a preacher, God will put you to the test for, for that message. He, you're going to experience something related to that message. Yep. I said, well, you don't know what I'm going to preach tomorrow. I said, but tomorrow I'm going to preach, hand me my harp. I said, I passed the test. And I had joy in my heart, Martin, because you know what? I didn't cuss. I didn't get upset. I didn't get aggravated. I wasn't, you know, cursing God. I wasn't being aggravated. I didn't cry. I didn't weep. I didn't wail. I didn't have a negative reaction to being stuck there. I said, no, Lord, you know what? You blessed me in such a way. I've got a credit card in my pocket that 10 years ago I couldn't have gotten if I wanted it. But I've got that in my pocket. If I need to get out of this hole, I've got the available. I can get out of this hole. I can pay the man. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. Well, I'm telling you, God bless me. Yesterday before I left the house, I constantly make trips like this, and I'll forget to put anything in the van or to bring anything with me for my diabetes, you know. Yesterday, guess what? God reminded me. I took a couple of uh, the little Lucerna shakes that I use or whatever they're called. Mm -hmm. I took some orange juice. I took some fruit packets, you know, with the apples and the grapes and the cheese and all that. And I had, I had plenty had plenty. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm telling you folks, I, I could have cursed God. Why? Why? Out of everything, out of everything, if you look at the whole picture, first of all, I enjoyed the trip going up like you would have believed. I had the time of my life. I was like a kid in a candy shop the whole way up. Of course, 
Tommy was like a kid constipated, but we won't discuss that. <laughs> He finally got unplugged when we got up there, and we were stuck in the mud. All of a sudden, he's, hey, land in the country, yay! We're standing there in the middle of the boondocks. Trees all around us, you know, pads into it. He said, you know, I really could like this. I really do enjoy it. This is really nice. And you just want to look at him and say, really? <laughs> Really? Now, we saw lightning bugs. It's been years since I've seen lightning bugs. I was so tickled. If I'd have had me a mayonnaise jar and an ice pick, I'd have gone and caught me some and used them as a lamp. You remember when we used to do that when we were kids? Children, I want to tell you something. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up because I'm hitting my hour already. I want to tell you something. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy of our honor. He's worthy of glory. It doesn't matter what our circumstance. It doesn't matter our situation. It doesn't matter where we're at or what we're going through. It doesn't matter what we're experiencing. It doesn't matter that Trump's in the White House. It doesn't matter that we're going through financial trouble. It doesn't matter that our spouse has asked for a divorce. It doesn't matter that we failed at our class in school. It doesn't matter that we got stuck in the woods. None of that changes God. Amen. He's still worthy. Even in that place, even in Babylon, He blessed us. Why? Because we praised Him in Babylon. Even by the rivers of Babylon, God can bless you, folks. Even by the rivers of Babylon, it don't matter. God can bless you where you're at. He gave us a toll that cost me uh, half of what I was expecting, at least half, because I thought it would be at least four or five hundred dollars. Because I'm not kidding. You should have seen, you know, what they had to pull us. I'm not kidding. It was a mess, you know, pulling us out of that mess. I, and he had to come so deep into the woods, it wasn't even funny. He told me, he said, it's about, I think he said it was like seven or eight miles he had to drive into the woods to get to us. And he told me, he said, honestly, if I'd have known where you were at, he said, because I picked people up here before. He said, I wouldn't have come. I would have passed it off on somebody else. He said, I would not have come. He said, I hate to come here. This spot is horrible. I didn't burn out my transmission. I'm driving a stinking minivan, folks. A guy with a four-wheel drive truck burned out his transmission trying to get up that hill. I'm driving a Dodge minivan, and it didn't hurt my transmission. I drove home. Are you following me? God can bless you in Babylon. God can bless you where you're at. And if you worship the Lord, He can change your situation. Hallelujah. Paul and Silas at midnight begin to pray, and guess what? God made it so they didn't have to stay where they were at. So if you put your harp in the willow tree when you're in Babylon, you're going to stay in Babylon a while. Because you ain't getting out of Babylon until that heart comes down. Hallelujah. So instead of moaning and groaning and weeping and wailing, look at the guy next to you and ask him, Hey, hand me my heart. Hallelujah. It's time to worship the Lord. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Glory to God. Amen.